Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 179 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at carbon footprints. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that we've got a great roundtable episode planned for next week. Three excellent guests with interesting topics of discussion. Now, I'm not going to spoil the content too much, but I will say that my topic will be roaming. Why can't we access every charger on every roaming app? So there's that to look forward to. Our main topic of discussion today is carbon footprints, but not quite in the way you might think. If you've been listening for a while, you'll remember that last season, I used the penultimate episode as a clip episode by releasing sections of the interviews that I hadn't previously released to the public. During every interview I have with a guest, I ask them a specific question, record the answer, and collate the answers into a single episode. Last season, the question I asked was, what was your best and worst charging experience? That episode, number 159, had some excellent responses, including Tom Cheesewright, who uses his laptop and a USB cable to start and stop charging on his homemade EV. Neil Riddle, who had to go searching for a charge post when a contractor had hidden it underneath plastic. And Jill Knoll, who left her EV charging longer than she wanted and ended up getting something of an irate letter from a fellow EV driver. So go and check that episode out, link in the show notes. Now this season, I went a little bit deeper. I asked participants two questions. The first one was a little palate cleanser of a question and related to what keeps you awake at night from a renewables and climate point of view. Unfortunately, that question appears to have brought out the doom and gloom amongst many guests, with some of them seeing things as an existential threat. Hydrogen, and is hydrogen a thing? Will it be needed? Is there a place for it in transport? And I feel like There's a lot of time and effort being wasted in arguing and debating. Actually, it would be a lot better if that time and energy was spent thinking about where is it most useful to use hydrogen and then going after those opportunities. Honestly, I I can't think about it before I go to bed. When I do, I can't. It's just, you look at, I don't know how anybody can sleep (laughs) if you think about it. Sort of the flooding and then the heat waves. I mean, last year I think it was a real eye opener to people. Like last year was the hottest summer mm-hmm. on record. It will also probably be the coldest one that we'll have from yes. here on in, and that's going to be yeah. the pattern. <sighs> oh God, I, I'm similar to James. I try not to think about it before bed, and sometimes that means I have to distract myself by playing the Xbox for a few extra hours just to get <laughs> out of my head. And that's at least that's what I tell my wife, right? Um, right now, I think my my um, my stress point, shall we say, is the blatant the blatant stuff coming out of the fossil fuel co- companies, the the shells and the BPs of this world, who are just blatantly saying they are going to roll back their environmental and renewable mm-hmm. stuff because it's not profitable enough. Yeah, which is just not good enough as far. That's as unconscionable, I'm really, isn't it? So I I think I'm probably not unique in my first thoughts to this in that. For me, it's really about um, how important this is to decision makers across the globe. So um, I think sometimes sustainability can be a um, a nice to have. And I, and I think one of the things that for me is, is front of mind is that it can't be. It needs to be a hygiene factor. It needs to be front of everyone's thinking to really elicit change and make sure it gets the the focus and direction that that that's needed and actually when you set up the tension of the potential economic cost of not making change versus the short term profit gain for a country potentially of doing something else um it's really important we call out where sustainability and and climate action isn't getting the focus that's needed. The thing that keeps me awake at night is the fear that we're already too late 
um, I still struggle with getting over the the heat wave last summer. Um, I was talking to somebody about this just the other day. Last summer, I don't even really remember it. I mean, we were working a lot because we just started the business. We were in the car um, for the aircon benefits as much as traveling around to sites and getting inspections done. But on every sunny day that I had free time, I wasn't out enjoying the sunshine. I was laying in bed with the fan on, with the curtains drawn, desperately trying to stay cool um, and worrying about my nieces and nephews and and their future. And also, you know, really having to question whether or not this is the kind of world that I want to bring my own children into. So I don't have any children right now. And it's something that I, I would like. But when I think about, you know, the reality of, of where the planet is, is there going to be a planet for my future children, grandchildren to actually enjoy? That I wish I could move faster. I, the bits that keep me awake are we're just not doing enough quickly enough. And when I've got my children who look at life through very rose tinted glasses and very simplistically, I just feel we are not doing enough collectively around the globe, anything, we're just not doing enough. A specific answer, a specific thing that keeps me awake at night from an environmental point of view is a conversation that I heard at a dinner table about a year ago between my boss, Dan Caesar, and a chap called Peter Van Voorst, who's a Dutch entrepreneur. He's the founder of a company called Schoon, which is sort of like Airbnb for batteries, um, in which they were discussing moving to houses on top of hills in the next decade. And that really slammed home the reality of the situation. When you hear people much cleverer than yourself talking about getting above sea level in the next few years, really does drive the message home that this is real and it's upon us. You heard Claire Miller, James Court, Warren Phillips, Alexandra H.C. Borgdes, Kate Tyrrell, Lorna McAteer and Jack Scarlett in that little uh, montage. And we'll be hearing more from them in a short while. Now, I segued on quickly from that to the follow-up question, which is what changes are you personally making over and above an electric car with you and or your family to help reduce the planet's carbon footprint? So, as usual, I'll start. Now, I've had an EV for over four years now. As with many people, the EV put me on a path towards researching and understanding other aspects of energy production and reduction. Now, as a result, I installed solar panels, a home storage battery and a heat pump. I'm pretty much 100% gas-free in my house and I'm using, on average, a 1,000 kilowatt hours less energy per month in my house than I was prior to installing the tech. That's equating to reduced bills although the hike in prices due to the, uh, the energy crisis has reduced that somewhat. But in fact, if I was paying the same per kilowatt hour now as I was last year, my bills would be substantially lower, approximately £70 a month lower. And that's on a tariff where I was only paying £70 a month on a direct debit. Now, on top of that, I don't eat meat. I haven't taken a flight since 2008. And I practice vermiculture, which is using worms to break down food waste into castings, which is a a plant food high in nitrogen that works better than traditional compost. So that's what I was doing. And I thought I was doing pretty well when it came to things like this until I spoke with Claire Miller, formerly of Octopus Energy. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous about this because I don't want to sound really preachy. And I think that's maybe an issue, actually, for all of us when we start talking about things. So this is our choice that we made because it suits our, our lives and we thought it was the right thing for us to do uh, as well as it being a good thing to do. So um, I doubt you'll get an answer like this from others, but so making choices about like where we had our children, for example. So I had both of my children at home. There's a carbon footprint associated with having a baby in hospital. There's a lot of waste and, and single use products that goes into it. There are other reasons as well, but like having a baby at home is really low impact. Um, breastfeeding. So if you can, you've got the right support and, and if you can make it work, it's it's really good thing to do for the environment because making formula is incredibly water and energy intense. And you know, we're lucky in the UK that we have clean water and we have access to, to energy to um, to make the formula, but in lots of countries they don't. So actually, you know, if we could support breastfeeding, if we could make it back to being, you know, much more culturally acceptable and we could we could support people in doing that, it would have uh, an environmental impact as well. So that was important for us. We used cloth nappies and we had our children. So it's all very child centric. I think lots of people have this 
you know, this this stage of their life where they think about as a family, what can we do to reduce impact? So again, cloth nappies, um, not using, you know, a single use plastic nappy every time um, and just having a small set of cloth nappies that we used and washed. So those are some of the things we did when the, when our children were smaller. Um, we're a veggie household. We're often vegan, but not always. So that's something that we're thinking about looking at um, and how we can, we can in, kind of keep going down that route. Um, and I think the main, the main one is actually we're very open in our family about what we're using and why we're using it and what we're doing as part of the broader Kind of use of energy, but you probably would expect that. So, you know, I have vehicle to grid systems running in my home. So the children have understood from a very young age where the energy is coming from, why we're doing it, what does it mean? So I guess maybe educating the next generation, which also sounds very kind of, you know, very obvious, but it's really important we talk to children about not just don't turn that, turn that light on. It's, hey, do you know where the energy is coming from? Do we really need to use that now? Could we do something different? And I think probably as a family, that's the most important thing is is to make sure that the children understand the world that they're inheriting because they're going to have a lot of these problems to solve. We're not going to do it in one generation. I also chatted with Warren Phillips, chairman of EVA England. So I'm well known for this stuff. Uh, actually, I came into EVs the way around. For me, electric car was, was, wasn't the first thing. So um, I mean, obvious ones are, you know, renewable tariffs and going to a, a renewable supplier. That's the easy one. Mm-hmm. Um, but so in, in our house, we've, we've taken the 1970s average UK house, 1970 semi detached house. Um, uh, we have, uh, solar panels. We have a Tesla power wall. We have an air source heat pump. We have triple glazing. We have cavity wall insulation and solid insulation on some of the walls. Um, we have cut down our water use. We have cut down our waste with composting and being very careful about what we do. Um, meat is high on our agenda for this year. Um, we stopped flying, so only flights where we, there was no other option. Um, and that, that has meant little holidaying for us. Um, I think we, we went, we went on a, we had a flight last year, went to Milan, I went to Barcelona, which was like a, a real treat for us. We were talking about one this year, but I don't think we're even going to have a flight this year. Um, I think we're now driving across to France if we do that, if we do that trip. Um, so everything is about reducing our our impact on the planet. We, we 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 do this stuff. And alongside that, the things I do as well is I advocate for this stuff. So I am I'm part of local groups for transition town stuff where I open up my house and show people how it's done. Um I help people like people come to me now. I've had an email just now saying I need some help with this someone's someone's come and said this stuff on my solar panels, can you help me? Um I do whatever I can. I'm, I'm a part of a retrofit group in my local area where I speak and I answer questions about how people can do this stuff when they're renovating and retrofitting their houses and how we can take our current housing stock and make it better. Because like, we can't all afford to build new houses. It's not going to happen. We just have to take what we've got. We have to do better with it. James Court, CEO of EVA England, added. <laughs> it's, it's part of our daily conversation about lots mm-hmm. of things. So we try not to fly, you know, we, we give ourselves one flight for holiday yep. a year. And for business reasons, if, if I can, if we can, you know, obviously flying is, is the last possible thing that we try and do from a company perspective. Um, we have our, we've just got our solar panels installed. Um, if anybody knows my partner, heat pumps are her passion and our house is heat pump ready and we'll be getting one of those very shortly. Um, and then personally for me, this is also horrendous is that I do eat a lot of meat and I, that's the next thing. That's the thing for this year um, is trying to, trying to cut down on my meat consumption and especially cows. I try, yeah, that's now, that will be a very, very rare treat for me this year. Uh, you may remember I chatted with Jonathan Jenkins from Motability and he had a fun little tidbit to share. Perhaps one of the, the ones that is top of the agenda for me is, is actually waste. And I, I feel like, we've become an incredibly wasteful, we have an incredibly wasteful culture. And I'm not just talking about the waste we throw away and the plastic we throw away and how we buy packaged foods. I'm also talking about things like clothes and, you know, household materials. I think, you know, it pains me how much people buy that they don't need and how much they, you know, refuse to reuse. And I think that's one of the things that it's almost a really small change that if everybody did it, it would make a huge difference. I mean, my wife has now taken to a website called Vinted, 
Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if you've heard of that, but it's basically a secondhand retailer, almost like Facebook Marketplace. I'd say all of my son's clothes, everything my son owns, is secondhand. And I actually say that now with pride. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's not necessarily a decision based on finance alone. That's a decision based more on sustainability. Everything I grow out of or no longer need, I mean, I used to wear shirt and ties to the office. We no longer have that culture. That gets sold on Vinted. Um, so we're really, I guess, within our household, we're trying to do what we can to measure waste, to reduce things like energy usage. And, you know, we're not in a luxurious position where we live, you know, we live in a terraced house in Bristol. Okay? So I can't even have a home charger. So we're not in that position where we can start thinking about ground source heat pumps, even solar panels are, are quite tricky for us in, in where we live. Um, that's where I'd love to be. But I think, you know, a lot of people are not going to be there. A lot of people are going to be in the same position as me. But I think it's just recognizing that actually, if you make some small changes to your life, and they are small changes, the changes we have made have not really impacted us, you know, shop local, refill bottles, thing, things like that, that you don't actually notice once you start doing. Alexander Hammond Chambers Borgdis from LV Insurance had something of an interesting perspective on this. We are um, about to go through a period of renovation in our house and we're looking to make sure our house is sus- as sustainable as possible. Um, but one of the big things we do, we're, we're fortunate um, to have links into a charity who look at helping households understand their carbon emissions and make choices as to how to offset those. And I appreciate offsetting is um, sometimes a controversial topic, but I think at an individual household level where you know that there's room for improvement. So we live in quite an old house um, that we're looking to um, improve in terms of efficiency. Whilst we do that, we need to acknowledge that actually we, we should be offsetting. We should be making sure that our household as, as a whole isn't negatively impacting the, the planet. So that's what we do at a household level at the moment. Are you looking at putting solar battery heat pumps in while you're running? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at, at solar at the moment. Um, we live in a conservation area, so we, we've we got quite a lot to do in terms of making sure that the plans of our house, um, from a, a visual point of view, I hate to say it, are acceptable. Um, for the area we live in, as well as meeting the brief that we have of trying to make it as um, efficient as possible. But it's even just simple things like all our windows are very old. Our house isn't very consistently insulated. So there's there's lots we know we can do even before we we get to the hopeful end goal of renewing renewable energy. Kate Tyrrell from ChargeSafe also talked about what she's doing over and above making charging safer for everyone. This was especially interesting as a lot of her reduction came from an area I would least expect, IT. Yeah, so I mean, like my my life really is my business at the moment. Personally, the only thing that I really do for myself anymore is um, my beauty regime, so my skincare and makeup. Um, I've switched out to uh, more sustainable supplied brands. Um, I use like a, a flannel instead of disposable cotton pads. Um, so I've made small changes like that to my daily routine, which I think will have um, you know an, a nice little impact uh, in the grand scheme of things. But like I say, my, my life is my business. So um, we drive green. Anybody who works for or, or with us um, is either supplied with an electric vehicle or we supplement their, their own electric vehicle. Um, we will never have a petrol or diesel vehicle in our fleet doing work, carrying out work on behalf of ChargeSafe. Um, our uh, servers that we've selected are green. Um, James has done his research into that and he can back that up with his facts. Uh we use sustainable suppliers. So for things like our, our merchandise, we've been very, very careful uh, not to have a detrimental impact on the environment by making sure that it's recycled materials, um, that the, uh, uh, the businesses themselves have a, a good ESG policy. Um, we are 
using public transport more. So today, uh, James and I have a meeting in London this afternoon and we will be catching the train um, instead of driving the vehicle, which is great. And I think um, just in general with my family and my life, I am constantly having the conversation as to why they should go electric and not be driving a diesel vehicle. (laughs) And I'm desperately trying to encourage my brother-in-law to change all of his electrician's vans out for electric vans. Um, And I think it's just those those small daily conversations that we have that will eventually impact better things. And actually two of my best friends, by the way, um, Penny and Caprice, love them, have gone electric, which is insane. So these are girls that I've known from high school. One's driving an EV6. The other one has gone for a, a, a mini, uh, mini electric. Um, and I'm so, so proud of them because they've really shown like, you know, normal people can go electric too. Uh, it doesn't have to put you out of pocket. They've found ways to to go electric um, and they've done that for their, their families. Lorna McAteer from National Grid talked about some of the things she's doing. We're trying to do things in the simple way that you can. So we've got all the water parts. We grow our own vegetables where we can. We're doing what we can with walking more. Although the kids still try and say, Mom, can you take me to school? But it's making sure we walk a lot more and actually use the vehicle less where we can. So the challenges I have personally, I have an exceptionally old house. And each time I go to do something new to it, it's can I do it in a more sustainable way? If I'm changing those windows, can I do it more environmentally friendly? Have I got the space to do any kind of air pumps or not? Um, I already know my roof isn't strong enough to be able to put solar panels on. So what else can I do? So we do things as simply as possible by reducing as much as we can. So recycle bins are always there. We do an awful lot of crafting in our house because we reuse everything that we can. And we just do things in the simple way that we can and try not to overcomplicate it. That way, it just becomes part of your normal daily routine. And a week or two back, we had Jack Scarlett on the show from the Fully Charged Show. Here's what he told me. That's a really good question. And again, I think my answer was quite London centric. I come from a fairly anti-social city where people keep themselves to themselves. And that, you know, that's not reflective of wider society necessarily. But, you know, this climate change crisis is upon us. We are witnessing freak weather events globally. They're in the news every week. So I don't know how much more real it has to get before people wake up to the reality of the situation. Um, and I'm beginning to wonder if there is no level, you know, until people are literally swimming to their kettle in the morning to make a cup of tea, they're not going to really appreciate the gravity of the situation until it very personally affects them. The quick and easy things that you can do that I'm trying to do are centered around just being less of a consumer. Um, I, I had a real weakness for bottled water for a long time. I'm an Evian man, Gary, and that's who I am. Uh, but, but I've, you know, I've, I've since bought a reusable, refillable, lovely metal water bottle, which you've probably seen in the background of many a fully charged video and which I carry with me everywhere, you know, because every little helps. Now, ironically, every time we go overseas for a shoot, I leave that bottle in an airport and have to buy a new one. So the extent to which I'm actually making the world a better place by doing that is up for debate, but I am trying. Uh, likewise, I'm trying to do more vintage shopping. I'm trying to buy more used clothes, which is always something that I've been interested in doing. And I live in Hackney, so there's plenty of cool and trendy places to do do so. So that's an entirely achievable one. And then beyond the car, I suppose the other thing is avoiding driving as much as possible. And this is not necessarily a um, climate change motivated choice. It is simply a fact that cycling is a far preferable method of getting around London. So we've got a couple of themes emerging there, I think you'll agree. Uh, Vintage and recycled clothes seem to be fairly popular. Uh, Minimising single-use waste is also popular, as are the big ticket items for those that could afford it, such as solar panels, heat pumps and batteries. So I'd like to thank everyone who came on the show this season, even those who didn't make it into this episode. To be honest, there were so many great stories and examples that I had to be a little bit selective. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening to the show this season. This is the final main episode of the season. All we have left is the Roundtable show, which will be coming next week. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. It's been a cool thing before on an earlier episode of this podcast, 
but I think given the theme of today's episode, it would be appropriate to re-up this as something you might like. How Bad Are Bananas is a book written by Mike Berners-Lee, brother of uh, World Wide Web creator Tim, and it details the carbon footprint of everything you do on a daily basis, from using a sheet of toilet paper, writing an email, posting a tweet, right up to driving a petrol car or taking a flight. If you really want to reduce your carbon footprint, it's always worth understanding what your current footprint is and where the best bang for your buck lies. A few years ago, ZapMap heard a message coming loud and clear from EV drivers across the country. Make paying for charging simple. In light of this, ZapPay was launched with a mission to sign up all the key networks across the UK. The payment solution is a simple way to pay for electric car charging across networks from within the ZapMap app. As a single app payment solution, ZapPay avoids the hassle of using multiple apps across different networks. It also means that EV drivers can search, plan, and pay for charging all within one app. With ZapPay, you'll also be able to view your charging history, receive live status updates while away from your vehicle, and download those all-important receipts. On-street charging provider Connected Curb is the latest to go live on ZapPay. It's the ninth charging network to come online with ZapPay following Osprey, ESB Energy, Chargey, GeniePoint, Mer, MFG EV Power, Fastned, and Alpha Power. Even better, you can now use both Apple Pay and Google Pay on ZapPay. This means that around 7,000 ZapPay charging devices across the UK are currently Apple Pay and Google Pay enabled. So alongside searching for charge points, planning longer journeys, and sharing updates with other EV drivers, using ZapPay means you can quickly and easily pay for EV charging on all nine networks up and down the UK. Expect further announcements and integrations with ZapPay in the coming weeks and months. EVV and Charge by Street are next to go live with ZapPay with more networks lined up for the months beyond. Why not give ZapPay a try and let ZapMap know what you think? And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musing TV with the words, carbon footprints all over the place. Hashtag if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, he found an old lamp the other day and rubbed it. Out popped a GD and granted him three wishes. Simon looked back over all the videos of him scooting along some road or path on his electric unicycle, and he knew immediately what he wanted. He turned to the genie and he said, I have one wish only. I wish I could move faster. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.